Green Crow Inn, a novel by Derek A. Kamal, read by Kelman Friedman. Chapter 5. The Dads. Six and ten and another for my men, one more round and one more again. Let's drink, my lads, for the day is clear and the women at home are our only fear. The chorus ended and the dads burst out in an uproar of laughter. Again. It was beginning to sound a little forced. The song was fun the first time, in a rustic sort of way, but now it grated on my nerves. Furrier popped his frowning face in from the porch-side door with a look so foul I could nearly smell it. He shook his head at no one in particular, then he disappeared back outside to whatever it was he was pretending to work at. Furrier, cried Kalka from the bar. The troll put his head back in the common room, shouted something that sounded like, Gotta fix the joist! Then closed the door again. Kalka wagged her head and surveyed the common room, and I with her. There wasn't much on. The dads seemed to have carved their own pocket out of the space, there being a visible gap between them and the rest of the patrons. One group of patrons had loudly and obviously retreated to the balcony. I thought of Chatan, working the room just yesterday, how everyone seemed to crowd around her. This was markedly inverted. Those remaining patrons were few in number, having either avoided the inn entirely because word spread of the dad's exploits, or having left early for the same reason. Sumi Kind nearly crashed into the bar, then stepped on the brass rung at its base to prop herself up. Another round, she said. Of? asked Kalka. Bluebark, and Skivron says he wants another glass of snail shell. Without prompting, I grabbed a tankard and went to the keg I was pretty sure contained Bluebark Porter. The first splash of golden liquid told me this was not so. I stopped the pour, grinned sheepishly at Kalka, then put the glass down. The innkeeper completed the order herself, sending dark blue froth cascading from the tap to glass in satisfying fashion. The wine, snail shell red, was presented in its bottle, what was left of it anyway. She waved Sumi back towards the dads. <laughs> that man is going to drink straight from the bottle, isn't he? I mused. Torsen, said Kalka. Because he thinks it's fashionable, not because he wants to, I continued. I appreciate the helpful attitude, said Kalka, but take your time. Check the taps. I swallowed my pride and nodded. Six and ten, began a single, excessively loud voice. Don't oh, stop it! At first I could not detect the source of the rebuke. I thought it must have been a dissatisfied customer, but no. Next to the table stood Sumi Kind, stiff and with bald fists whiskers shaking ever so slightly and staring down at the dads. A few tense seconds passed. Then she huffed and returned to the bar. Just be taking it out of my tips, she said, staring at the bar and not looking up. If there is a tip, said Kalka. Consolation was my first thought. It seemed to unfair that these louts should put so much strain on our compassionate server. This is demanding work, I said to Sumi, and we've all only so much we can take. She nodded still not looking up. If you are to be staying here, she began, you'll want to be understanding more of these men. They were... Oi! You there! I looked up from the pitiable pouting Sumi to find one of the dads addressing me. You there! N new guy! Whichever one it was that waved me over. I heeded his words and made the walk from the bar, swerving around the tables until I neared him. He had a sweaty pallor about his face that I found off-putting like looking at a ham that had set out a bit too long. I also did not care for his long braided goatee. You there, he said again, for no reason other than drink. I hear, I replied. He laughed, clearly missing the tinge of irritation in my voice. You're new, he slurred. New guy. So I'm going to tell you something. Something new. New, new guy. All right. I glanced to my left and saw Kalka staring in our direction like a carving. Sumi deftly slid by, depositing drinks and offering me a compassionate look. She placed the bottle of snail shell in front of me and the one who had called me over. This must be Skivrin. Do you know the secret of Taylor Hill? He swayed a little. Well, I said, as you so deftly noted, I am new. So no, I don't know the secret, though I did pass over it on my way. The wood of Taylor Hill, he spoke dramatically and slowly, his glassy eyes boring into me with the kind of unfeeling only a man four drinks in can produce. His voice dropped and grew scratchier with each syllable. 
The wood is a bargain. A terrible bargain struck aeons ago when the world was young and all was green and... Oh! A wig! A fair bit of ale poured down his sleeve. Another one of the dads, this one with crocked hair and a beard, had bumped into him. Sorry, Skiverin! The ale assailant shouted and righted himself. Skiverin looked angry. This other dad, called Herwig apparently, turned towards us and began to speak as if he'd been privy to our conversation the entire time. Hedna, youngest you remember, she's on a new routine where she's up every night complaining about not being able to sleep. Got Lastima and me up with her and I'm half asleep half the time, especially after a few of these, eh? He jiggled his mug and winked at Skivrin knowingly. But that's just family life, you know. I'm fine. How is your wife in the, um, thing, you know? Skivrin went red. It might have been the drink, but I have no doubt in my mind that I saw his lips quiver, as if fighting tears. I'm telling a story, man! He roared. Herwig backed away and resumed his conversation elsewhere. As I was saying, continued my new friend Skivrin. He took a deep breath and wiped his eyes. I wanted to inquire about this sudden emotion, but his voice dropped again into the tone of a half-drunk, novice storyteller. The wood of Teela Hill hides a great secret- <coughs> He coughed, which cost him a little of his dramatic fervor. A great secret indeed. I heard long ago... When the world was young and all was green, I offered, hoping to speed this up. It didn't work. When the world was young, he said, even more slowly, and all was green... I looked pleadingly back towards the bar. Sumi shrugged. The forest was expansive, covering all the land from here to the capitals with oak and elm. Those as lived round these parts waded in between the trees each season. After a sip, he set his bottle down and wielded an imaginary blade, hacking imprecisely at unseen brambles. Some of the dads began to listen, others, perhaps burdened by wakeful children like Herwig, or perhaps bored of the story already, had fallen asleep with their heads on the tables. They took their axes and bit those trees, felling them one by one without care. All they wished was to build upon this new land, he hiccuped, surprising himself, then continued, and feed their fires to keep them through the winter. Soon, as soon as the trees reckon anyway. I think the drink took hold at this point, and he began a little aside, saying, Can you imagine trees marking off a ruddy calendar? After a little laugh, he cleared his throat and continued the slurred tale. Then the forest was nearly gone. Only a broad sea of tree stumps remained as far as anyone could see. Standing alone like so many defenders was the wood of Teela Hill. Wow, tremendous story, I said. Really bang up stuff. Now if I could just... So, he shouted, causing at least one of his snoozing fellows to wake up with a start. The wood had to do something, but what? Well, nothing. They're trees! He laughed, causing a chain reaction of polite guffaws among the dads. Can you imagine? Trees parlaying or some such. At this, he drifted off into some kind of wine-besotted state of meditation. Everyone, at least those still paying attention, leaned towards him in anticipation. Then, shifting his voice to a higher tone, he said... Hello, I'm Mr. Tree. This is my wife, Mrs. Tree, and our son, Treason. More unenthusiastic laughter. Skivron sighed, satisfied, and then he hiccuped. The patrons of the nearest table looked our way in disgust. Anyways, a young man lived on Teela Hill. Whether he'd fled further and further into the forest and eventually up the hill, avoiding the X-Men, or he'd lived atop the hill all along, nobody knows. But he had a strange connection with the forest. Some kind of magic or art. Now he was more serious, the sloppy style leaving him almost completely. They say he could heal the trees and help them to grow more quickly. He emerged wearing only an oryx hide tunic and a cloak of leaves. The axemen saw him emerge from betwixt the trees like a spectre and they were sore afraid. He bade them halt their work and offered this bargain, speaking to them as an elder, though he could scarcely have seen twenty winters. Should they spare Teela Hill and show compassion to the trees, they would never want for wood again. But they must offer something in return. He wanted a wife. 
The few dads left standing let out an ooh, not unlike what their own children might do if they caught their parents in an amorous moment. I could see Skivron's eyes smiling above the bottle as he took another sip. The axemen said no more, but left the mysterious man and deliberated amongst themselves as is. One day later it was decided that they would agree to his terms on the condition that should he not keep his end of the bargain, should the wood run out, that they would have no choice but to clear-cut Teela Hill. But where to find a willing bride? His audience was down to two, not counting myself, the other dads having passed out or become distracted. An awkward pause lingered thick in the air. I frowned. Herwig moved his lips soundlessly, then said, Where? Where indeed? shouted Skivron with superlative drama. When the word indeed came out, he snapped his fingers and there was the slightest hint of blue light in his hand. Hang on, he muttered. Skivron fidgeted with something in his palm. After a bit of fuss and a lot of muttering, he tried again. This time, indeed, was punctuated by a rather huge and impressive bit of flame that shot up towards the beam ceiling of the common room. Herwig and I clapped. The other patrons jeered. That's it. Get out. Kalka loomed behind me, arms crossed. This seemed to sober the dads up a bit. One smacked another who had been sleeping. They began moving without argument. Come along, said one. Same time next month, said another. Not sure, said Herwig. Got a check with Lastima. Good story, though, Skivron. How'd you manage that bit of blue flame? Skivron cleared his throat, rose from his chair, ignoring the question. He murmured, Sorry, Kelka. Then turned towards his departing fellows. I hadn't even finished it. His voice echoed off the front wall as he stepped outside. The tale of the Wheeled Bride. I watched his back disappear into the evening that lay beyond the door of the inn and realized I would like to hear the end of the tale, though better told by less annoying a teller. The little trick he did at the end certainly grabbed my attention. How had he managed it? As the dads collected themselves and left a tumble of coin on the table, the other patrons emitted a collective sigh of relief. A tall man, even as tall as Kalka, approached us. He had a mop of black hair streaked with grey, and a prominent moustache accompanied by thick stubble along his square jaw. "'Sorry about that, Kalka,' he said. Kalka seemed surprised to hear it, as if she hadn't realized who he was. She visibly softened at the sound of his voice and even smiled slightly. My eyebrows raised, and thankfully, she didn't notice. "'All right, Elgad,' she said. After a moment or two, he spoke up again. "'Better be off home to the family.' Kalka nodded, her silky black hair swaying with her head. See you next time. Elgad nodded back, then pointed to the mound of money on the table. If it's not all there, I'll get the difference. Kalka nodded again, looking rather sad now. Elgad turned and walked away. I sighed and shook my head. The innkeeper was still staring at the door when I spoke to her. You couldn't have rescued me sooner, I demanded. It took Kalka a moment to respond, as if my words were slow to reach her ears. I suppose I was interested in the story, she said, and without looking at me began tidying up the table. I think Skivrin is barren. I blinked. What? I don't think he and his wife can have children. I blinked again. A swift expression of deep sadness took Kalka's face, and then it was gone. Now, help me clean, she said. This has been The Green Crow Inn by Derek A. Kamal, read by Kalman Friedman, with music by Michael Elliott. To find out more, including how to purchase your copy of the novel, please visit shorelessskies.com.